Yeah. Yeah, so uh, today we have a, a brilliant uh, opportunity, wonderful opportunity to uh, to host at our uh, seminar uh, Evandro, our colleague from Brazil, from Campinas, Evandro Kovov Christofelotti. That was okay. Okay, Christofelotti. Okay. <laughs> Christopher Letty, yeah, who will uh, share with us uh, share with us insights from his uh, from his uh, recently defended uh, defended uh, PhD thesis, uh, and he will discuss the fight for hegemony that is uh, ongoing in the Brazilian uh, higher education uh, system, and he will focus on the um, I think one of the winning sides of this struggle for he hegemony that is the right wing side uh, that simply takes over higher education in Brazil or at least it uh, wants to. I'm really looking forward to 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 hear more about this research and uh, after after uh, Evandro uh, uh, 45 minutes uh, small lecture paper. We will we will uh, comment on it and open the uh, general discussion. So, Evandro, okay. the floor is yours. You can share your screen, and uh, we are all ears. Let's share my screen. I don't know if it's working, but I, I guess it's working. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the group, Scholar Communication and Christian to the opportunity to speak about, uh, not only about my research, but, uh, but uh, uh, about the Brazilian higher education uh, scenario. Uh, as I was talking to Christian, uh, he mentioned that the Poland case uh, may be uh, has some similar similarities to the Brazilian in some aspects, so uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, let's try to to. Uh, I think now it's better. Uh, okay, so uh, my presentation it's named uh, as "Fighting for Hegemony in Higher Education: The Actions of the Brazilian Neoliberal Think Tanks." My name is Evandro. I'm from the Department of Science and Technology Policy from University of Campinas. And uh, I, I will be talking about my PhD research, which is recent, but uh, I, I'm trying to publish through this year, but the English uh, papers are under evaluation. So, but I, I could share one of them uh, that was uh, accept, uh, accepted, uh, but it will be pub published in next year, but anyway, Unfortunately, I don't have uh, papers in English. I have some, um, some of them under evaluation. If you are in this, interested, I could share uh, for sure. Uh, basically, the objective of my research um, was to ma map and analyze how and why uh, neoliberal think tanks have been operating in the field of higher education and science in Brazil. Uh, and I mean, as field of higher education, I mean the think tank's views and op opinions and, or arguments on higher education and science. Uh, the action of these neoliberal think tanks in higher education institutions itself, in teaching, research, and extension. Uh, and uh, the influence of these think tanks in higher education policy. So I try to understand this, why these organizations. Uh, and how they're acting in the field of hard, uh, hard education in Brazil. It was a exploratory research. Uh, as as uh, far as long as I know, uh, it's the only research that I that deals with this topic in Brazil. Uh, so I will bring this a, a kind of exploratory results uh, and try to discuss them. So. Uh, before I, I start to, to talk about higher education itself, I, I try to be quick in some uh, contextual or landscape uh, issues because I think it's important to understand. So first of all, what, what is think tanks? Uh, basically, think tanks are organizations that, that they act politically, uh, 
through the production of academic knowledge. So they, they, they their main goal it's it's to act polit politically on their public opinion or public policy based on the production of academic knowledge. So the think tanks are a kind of a very heterogeneous and diverse world, and I'm going to speak about a specific kind of think tanks that that are the neoliberal ones. So, but just to, to build a, a basic notion about think tanks, uh, I think these two topics here, they could summarize. Uh, so they, think tanks, they work with knowledge production designed to influence public policy and public opinion. Uh, that's the main goal of uh, the think tanks. Normally in the field of social science, normally they produce uh, studies, they produce uh, publications, they act in the media, they do a lot of stuff uh, trying to uh, act political, political, politically, I don't know, how, I'm sorry, uh, but act in politics uh, through the knowledge, knowledge production in economics, law, uh, uh, philo even philosophy and this kind of things. So I think this is the first notion that we have to uh, uh, be aware. The second notion I think is important because I'm speaking to a broad uh, audience outside Brazil, it's uh, the higher education land, uh, landscape in Brazil. So basically, uh, it's very basic uh, that I'm, I, some information here. Uh, we have a large higher, higher education uh, system here with more than 2,000 higher education institutions uh, across the country. The most of them are private for profit and pri private for non-profit, 70% uh, of the enrollments. Uh, and the other 30%, that's about 30%, are public higher education institutions financed by the state without tuition fees. Uh, and these public higher education institutions uh, they conduct the majority of the research of the country. I think most than 90% of the research, scientific research in our areas of knowledge uh, are conducted by, by public higher education. Uh, but since the 90s, we, we are suffering a process of market, marketization and oligopolization uh, of higher education because uh, it's a huge market so we have uh, a kind of oligopolization process uh, and within uh, public higher education institutions, we have suffering some kind of a marketization process. I, it's, uh, I, I have no time to explain details this process, but uh, we uh, could discuss uh, later. So uh, what, what, uh, what was the methodology of the study? So uh, my study, I, I, my approach, it was a kind of a historical approach that I trace the trajectory of these neoliberal think tanks uh, in Brazil since the 90s. Uh, considering that these neoliberal think tanks uh, are under a neoliberalism intellectual movement, then later I will uh, explain. So I, of course, I incorporate in my research the discussions about neoliberalism in Brazil in the 90s uh, and the intersection more, uh, more recent uh, between neoliberalism and the why we, we are calling new right here in Brazil. So this was the background of my research. Uh, empirically, I, I map this kind of organizations here in Brazil and uh, based on this mapping process, I could identify uh, some of these organizations that they are uh, operating in higher education field. And then I could analyze, analyze these organizations. Uh, in, other, in order to analyze, I used the debates about hegemony and organic intellectuals from Ganty. And now I will explain why. Uh, but basic, basic I, I use the hegemony and I use Gramsci debate because these neoliberal think tanks, they uh, hate Gantt because they accuse Gantt to be one of the fathers of the leftist indoctrination 
here in Brazil. So, but anyway, uh, what is the neoliberal intellectual movement uh, in my research? So uh, in the, well, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we have um, an intellectual movement, we had actually, uh, of renew, renew uh, the classical liberal thought and make it, it more influential. Because uh, as we know uh, in the world, the, this classical liberal thought, uh, Adam Smith and so on, this, this kind of discussions, uh, were a kind of uh, criticized because the economic crisis, oligopolization process, uh, Keynesianism, Marxism, socialism. So uh, in this context, the, this classical liberal thought was a kind of hindered. Uh, and some intellectuals and businessmen, they uh, sought to uh, act and connect uh, between themselves to create, to renew the liberal, uh, the classical liberal thought. Uh, basically, they, they wanted to act in the battle of ideas. It, this is a, a word that they use, it, uh, they use a lot. So, and defend a free market, uh, free market society. So under this Mount Pelerin society, we have uh, a plenty of uh, approaches that I'm considering as neoliberal ones. So Chicago School and Austrian School of Economics, public choice, uh, even anarcho-capitalism, among others. Some of them are very, uh, or are unknown by, by, uh, by the most of the people. Some of them, uh, like Chicago School of Economics, are more uh, influential in some countries. Uh, some of them, like Austrian School of Economics, uh, there's a kind of, depends on the country, but it could be influential in terms of politics, but it could uh, not be as well. Uh, but what is important to me in my research, it's, uh, it was identified uh, that this multi society, this association between intellectuals, and I'm including Frederick Hayek, uh, Mises, Milton Friedman, uh, Hotbard, and a kind of a plenty of neoliberal intellectuals in this association. Uh, but what is important, uh, they argued that the academic and intellectual circles were dominated by socialism and what they call collectivism. So collectivism is perspectives that defend the, uh, uh, the state on the economy, on society, and so on. So basically speaking, since uh, the 40s, uh, they, they, they see the intellectual circles, the academic uh, space as uh, spaces dominated by socialism and collectivist perspectives. So this was, this was, uh, was not uh, something uh, uh, recent. It was a kind of uh, old story. Uh, to, make, uh, to bring some example of think tanks, neoliberal think tanks, we have, for example, Institute of Economic Affairs uh, in the United Kingdom that it, it was famous because uh, operates very close to Margaret Thatcher's government and they design public policies for Margaret Thatcher. It's very close to Frederick Hayek. Uh, we have Atlas Network from United States, Cato Institute from United States, that are very influential in terms of politics with the, um, uh, uh, of both of uh, the parties in the United States, but especially the Republican Party. Uh, and we have a plenty of examples, but uh, we could talk about the Brazilian ones. Uh, just to make a, two references about this neoliberal intellectual movement, because I don't have much time to talk about that. Uh, uh, these two books are very interesting to capture this, this movement, uh, especially this second one, The Road from Mont Pelerin, The Making of Neoliberal Talk Collective. So uh, just to uh, mention some literature that it, that's interesting in the scope of the research. Uh, so basically, 
Uh, I define a liberal think tanks as organizations that they create in intellectual niches or networks of ne neoliberal thinking capable of operating politics, linking up with conservative political movements, parties, media, etc. Uh, they produce studies, publications, books, tests, articles, reports, editorial activity, hold seminars and academic lectures, and policymaking. Uh, normally, they are composed of experts in economics, political science, law, philosophy, among others, uh, social and humanities. Uh, but generally, they are financed by businessmen from all sectors. It, this is a kind of pattern uh, that you will, uh, you will see in almost every think tank in the world. So basically, like that. So just an, uh, an image to illustrate, this is Atlas Network. And Atlas Network was founded by a businessman called Anthony Fisher in the 70s in the United States. Uh, in part, uh, Hayek was very close to Anthony F Fisher in order to create this organization. And basically, Atlas Network is a kind of the father and mother of neoliberal think tanks because they train, they provide training, they provide uh, resources, they provide connections and network to other um, neoliberal think tanks in the world. So uh, it's from their, their website. Uh, they have connection with uh, this number of think, neoliberal think tanks uh, in the world. So if you see Latin America here, it's a hundred of neoliberal think tanks that uh, have direct, direct connection with Atlas Network. So it was a global network of neoliberal think tanks and they share ideas, they share uh, trainings, they share resources, they share, uh, well, spaces of knowledge production. Anyway, they share, uh, 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 the way that they operate, it's a kind of uh, similar and so on. Uh, so for example, I, I took this, uh, it's a, a article published by Atlas Network about the Brazilian reality. So basically they, Brazil with the logical crossroads, menos Marx, mais Miss, it, it was less Marx and more Misses uh, in English. So. Basically, Atlas Network was very close to the process of uh, acting of neoliberal think tanks and the new right here in Brazil, uh, since, especially since 2010. Just to, to bring an, an example. Another example from United States, it's the think tank called the Students for Liberty, uh, what is a network of uh, students that they sought to promote uh, studying groups, neoliberal liberal and conservative studying groups uh, through United States, but uh, they, they have a connection with other parts of the world. They have, uh, uh, I don't know if it's in English, they have uh, like uh, children organization, their sons organizations, their filials in the, in the other, uh, countries, including Brazil, that I'm, I will talk about this organization more specifically. Uh, another example, this is Mises Institute, uh, also from United States. So it's a pattern that United States have, in the Brazilian case, uh, a great influence of in the neoliberal think tanks here in the new right. Um, so this is the only the, the website of Mises Institute. As you can see, they they disseminate uh, tests, but they, they have books, they, they have podcasts, video, events, uh, and so on. Uh, but in Brazil, the specific, uh, the specific case of Brazil, basically the neoliberal think tanks in Brazil, they, they were founded in the 80s, because in the 80s, we uh, had a process of political redemocratization re and uh, new constitu constitution. So it was a kind of uh, a space for political organizations to fl flourish. Uh, at the same time, at the end of the 90s, we uh, had uh, the implementation of neoliberal policies. So 
it was a kind of a uh, good time to then to to be created or to be disseminated so uh, basically speaking the neoliberal think tanks in brazil they they were founded by businessmen and some intellectuals members of the Mount Pelerin Society. So it was a, a very direct uh, connection between the Mount Pelerin Society and the foundations, the creation of neoliberal think tanks in Brazil, because the members of, the Brazilian members of the Mount Pelerin Society, uh, they created uh, the first neoliberal think tanks here in Brazil. Um, I forget to mention, but this Mount Pelerin Society works uh, until now and have a plenty of members to the world, academics, businessmen, journalists, and this kind of things. So uh, basically speaking, and basically speaking, they uh, were directly influenced by Atlas Network, especially Anthony Fisher, that it's this, it was this businessman that founded Atlas Network and Hayek. And they uh, were inspired by the British, British Institute of Economic Affairs that I men mentioned. Uh, um, earlier. So, for example, the first one, it was Instituto Liberal, that was in English, is a kind of liberal institute that was fo uh, founded in, uh, in the beginning of the 80s. Uh, and the, the main goal of the liberal institute uh, is, is, because it's working until today, uh, to cultivate this neoliberal thinking, especially Hayek and Mises, uh, and try to influence, in their words, the opinion make se making sectors of society. So as students, teachers, and researchers, but businessmen, journalists, uh, lawyers, and jurists, the military sector, uh, right wing and right wing political parties. So this this was the first uh, uh, objective of the Instituto Liberal. Uh, but in the 90s and the 80s and 90s, uh, the neoliberal think tanks, including Instituto Liberal, they tried to influ influence in the promulgation of the new constitution in Brazil uh, through the recommendation of public policies, uh, acting in, in conservative movements and political parties, and so on. In the field of education, they uh, argue that the Brazilian higher education uh, need to be, even today, so I'm speaking even the, the, the actual scenario, uh, need to be privatized and a kind of uh, go through a process of flexibilization. Uh, the other argument that they stand for, it's that the higher education, especially higher education, needs to be uh, modernized especially the content, the curricula, and the knowledge production for, because of a, a new labor market, globalization, and uh, this kind of things, especially com combating Keynesianism and Marxist perspectives in economics. So this was the first uh, argument, the first uh, battle of ideas that they, uh, in the 80s, for example, Instituto Liberal sought to, to, to try to do. So they advocated basically uh, for charging tuition fees in public higher education and, to, and the need to promote university comp partnerships when it's not possible to privatize, okay? Uh, and they, they actually, they act in the field of higher education uh, in the 80s and the 90s through partnerships, partnerships with uh, higher education institutions, public and private. Uh, they promoted courses, uh, research competitions in economics, uh, they propose for public policies in the field and so on. So basically, this is, was the scenario uh, in the 80s and 90s uh, about the action of the Brazilian neoliberal think tanks and higher education field. And they were actually, they was very uh, un aligned with uh, the agendas of, for example, the World Bank, uh, the Monetary Fund, uh, about charging tuition fees in public education, about privatizing the sector, and this kind of thing. So it was a kind of a period, neoliberal period in Brazil, that uh, the the movements, the, the conservative and neoliberal movements, they are a kind of uh, in a coalition. Uh, let's say, let's say that. 
but nowadays that was the focus of my research uh the, these neoliberal think tanks they are very uh, aligned actually they participated uh, within the what we call the new right movement in brazil that is started uh 2005 but played their own it's hard to to um to point a specific date but it's a kind of uh 20 years ago 15 years ago uh so especially since uh, 2000, 2005, uh, this kind of neoliberal think tanks, they started to grow uh, along with this new right movement. So they participated in this new right movement. So what is this new right movement in Brazil? Uh, it's a set of new and old, we, we use this new right, but it's a kind of mixing of new and old movements conservative and right-wing and extreme uh, right-wing movements uh, and political groups that embrace uh, the uncompromising defense of a free market society, but also they oppose to gender equality discussions, they oppose to anti-racist movements, they oppose to human rights agenda. So basically they are conservative and uh, neoliberal in the, in, in the sense that defending a very a free market society. Uh, of course, they are heterogeneous in terms of uh, perspectives, in terms of uh, ideological uh, orientation. So they uh, don't agree all the time, of course. And we have some neo-fascist movements here, uh, including now. So we have a, a plenty of movements, a plenty of uh, uh, organizations and po uh, political parties. So Jair Bolsonaro, for example, uh, our president, or I don't know if it's a president, but anyway, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, for example, uh, it's a kind of a, a, a figure of this new right movement. Uh, so basically, they they basically they agree in in two points. It's a crusade against what they call cultural Marxism, uh, and they are united in coalition for fiscal austerity, uh, unrestricted privatization, and fighting the political ideolo ideological left. So this is a kind of uh, a thing that unites this new right movement here in Brazil. Uh, so the neoliberal think tanks, they participated in this new right movement, uh, they are important organizations. Some of them are huge organizations. Uh, for example, uh, the second one here, uh, Instituto Millennium, the, it's Millennium Institute. I think Millennium Institute uh, has more than, for example, more than 100 specialists working uh, on the Institute as associated specialists or as members, as directors and so on. Uh, but mo most of them, they are uh, a kind of organizations that they are composed at about 10 or 20 or even uh, uh, 30 members, uh, most of them specialists in economics, uh, uh, political science, and so on. And as I, I, I said before, normally they are financed by businessmen. And some of these businessmen, they will, uh, they participate as activists uh, uh, in this neoliberal think tanks in a very strong way. So we have Instituto Liberal, Liberal Institute, Instituto Millennium. Uh, we have Institute of Business Studies, uh, Liberal Institute of São Paulo, Mrs. Institute Brazil, Students for the Brazil, and so on. So this is the the, the largest ones. Coincidentally, they all, all of them they operate in the field of higher education. Uh, but my research, I mapped more than uh, 50 neoliberal think tanks uh, active in Brazil across the country, uh, basically speaking. So now that I established this, I don't know how how much time I have, but now that I, I you have more or less. 15 minutes or 17 okay. minutes. Thanks. Uh, now that I established this landscape, I could talk about specific, uh, about higher education. Uh, it, 
it is difficult to talk about our education without this kind of very fast landscape. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about our education. So my research, especially, I, I, I try to analyze how these think tanks uh, are operating or have been operating in the field of higher education, uh, especially since 2005 uh, to 2019. So this was a, the, the, my, my main time focus. So basically, I, I identified that these neoliberal think tanks, they operate in four ways uh, here in Brazil. They operate, the first one, as uh, to promote student organization and student activism. The second way, creating a neoliberal academic community uh, with intersection with some higher education institutions and research niches or centers. Uh, third, they're, they're acting, uh, spreading the view that universities are a space of leftist indoctrination, especially, especially Marxist and Keynesianism. Um, indoctrination, and they uh, have been acting in the, especially in higher education policy, uh, defending the privatiz privatization agenda and the kind of the mar marketization agenda in the public higher education. So in these four ways, they, they have been operating in the field of higher education. Uh, so we have, I bring some examples that I, I, I've been researching. Uh, I, I will try to be uh, quick, but uh, anyway. So uh, in the topic of student organization and student activism, the main think tank that operates in, field, in the field of higher education, it's, it's called Students for Liberty Brazil. Uh, the main goal of Students for Liberty Brazil is it's to train undergraduate students to become political activists. So uh, basically they go to the higher education institutions and they promote uh, among the, some interested students, uh, study groups and they hold lectures on liberalism and politics. And through this process, the aim of these organizations is to train po politically speaking, uh, neoliberal or conservative, uh, uh, students, leaders to act politically outside higher education. So um, I mapped more than uh, to a hundred of study groups ac across the country organ organized by uh, these organizations, uh, this organization called Students for Liberty Brazil. One of the most uh, interesting case about this organization that we have here in Brazil a uh, uh, political movement called Movimento Brasil Livre, which is Free Brazil Movement. It was a, uh, it is actually a political group, uh, was trained by Students for Liberty Brazil. So this political group is formed by students, but they, they have been acting very, uh, in a very strong way, defending uh, a neoliberal agenda in the state. They organized uh, demonstrations uh, against the, the Workers' Party. They was very influ influential uh, in the scope of our politics, especially uh, in the political coup that we had in, I think it was in two 2016. So just to bring an example, this political movement, Free Brazil movement, was trained by Students for Liberty Brazil, and they uh, have been acting in a very uh, strong way in, in your politics. Uh, some of, of them, in, in, uh, some of the, the, the leaderships of Free Brazil Movement, they actually, now they are congressmen. They are young congressmen and this kind of thing. So it was a, a very interesting process. And uh, more interesting, it's that the Students for Liberty Brazil uh, is an organization that uh, have a strong connection with the Students for Liberty of United States. Actually, they are a kind of a filial uh, a, a institution, and they operate in the same way, in the exactly same way that 
the Students for Liberty operate in United States in terms of training courses, in terms of resources, in terms of programs, in, in terms of the way that they organize the, the students. And uh, so uh, uh, in, in that sense, I, I did this, this image here. I don't know if it's a, this program, this kind of <laughs> uh, scheme here. So we have the agenda of Students for Liberty United States that the Students for Liberty in Brazil copy and act in the higher education institutions, especially, especially I'm a two-day student. And uh, it's my dog, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and they train students to become political activists. And eventually these students could create other think tanks. So this is the, basically the process that I, I mapped. Uh, this is a, a, a image of the website here. This is other, um, other uh, books, uh, bookstagram. So we have uh, Students for Liberty Brazil, they training leaders uh, under, most of them uh, are undergraduate students. Uh, these leaders organize student groups and student activist organizations uh, across the country. And the, the, we have leaders located in more than 30 important higher education institutions in Brazil, included the, the, the largest one, the Unicamp, University of Sao Paulo, and so on. And then this, these leaders train other leaders in other higher education institutions is a kind of spreading uh, process. Uh, I will be quick here, but in, in, uh, uh, in this topic about student organizations, we have also other think tanks like Unilivres Movement, Free Brazil Student Movement, uh, and so on. So there are a kind of, uh, we have a kind of plenty of organizations that operate in, uh, in terms of student activism. The second way, uh, the second way that the, these think tanks uh, are trying to operate in the field, field of higher education is through the creation of uh, an Austrian School of Economics Academic Community uh, with inter intersections with some higher education and research institutions. So the, 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 the main case here is Mrs. Brazil Institute. Uh, the, the think tank is the term that to create a Mrs. Brazil University He's here in Brazil. Uh, they have a strong editorial activity and they are all owners of professional book publishing companies. Uh, the businessmen that finance the, the Institute, the, uh, Mrs. Brazil Institute, they, they have uh, companies to publish books and these kind of things. Uh, they, they have been creating some ways of uh, produce knowledge in a kind of, uh, in the kind of academic way. So they created a postgraduate degree in Austrian School of Economics in Brazil, uh, in partnership with a private higher education institution. Uh, and they even created a academic journal called Mises International Journal of Philosophy, Law and Economics in 2013. Uh, so basically the work of Mises Brazil Institute is to train new specialists in Austrian School of Economics and influencing public policies through this process. Uh, this is the, the picture of the journal. Uh, I think it was interesting. So uh, I could share the link. It, it's in English, I think the information here. So uh, basically it's the journal that Mrs. Brazil Institute, uh, Mrs. Brazil Institute created. Uh, so for example, one of the papers that they disseminated, for example, they, they produced, uh, it's called, I, I translate in English, Less Marx, More Mrs. A New Paradigm of Knowledge and Action for Brazil. So this was one, for example, uh, paper of this uh, journal. So the journal is in, in that set in many uh, bases, uh, most of them Latin American ones. So it's a, a kind of official journal. It's not a kind of uh, uh, outsider journal, but, but have the, the accreditation process and this kind of evaluation process uh, as a normal journal here, here in Brazil. 
and the main publisher is Mrs. Brazil Institute in partnership with Atos Network. So this is uh, interesting to, to notice. Uh, so I, I go, I, I go uh, in, in my research, I, I, I went a kind of deep in this, in this discussion, but now I, I try to, to pass more quickly. But basically speaking, the members of the editorial board through time, they are the same members as uh, of Mr., the Mrs. Institutes across the world, uh, especially the Brazilian Mrs. Institute and the North American Brazil, uh, Mrs. Institute. So basically speaking, the editorial board of this journal uh, are composed by uh, members of, at the same time, they, they are members of the Mrs. Institute and they hold uh, some kind of position in some university. Uh, so they, they have been publishing research in Brazil uh, and abroad that was very uh, aligned to the perspectives of the Institute. They have been publishing more than uh, 18 volumes so far. And uh, the, motiva the motivation of this journal uh, is to create an academic communi community on Austrian School of Economics here in Brazil. So this was one of motiv the motivation. Uh, but in the end of the day, uh, they want to create the, this academic community uh, to legitimize the political action of the Institute because they argued that uh, it's, they could influence the media and the government in a more strong way if they have uh, academic uh, knowledge behind them. So, the, the, uh, and I, I could uh, identify that because they, they talked about, about that in podcasts, in some videos, in some events. So, so in, my, in my research, I listen all, almost all of the, of the podcasts. I watch almost all of the videos. I, I consulted documents. So I could identify that the main goal of the Mises Institute is to influence public policy. But they realized that uh, they have to be a, a, a kind of academic knowledge a process of a knowledge production in order to uh, get higher chances to uh, influence the media and public policy. So basically, the 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 journal it's uh, thought as a political instrument for the the Mises Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have. Evandro, we uh, crossed forty five minutes. If ah, you okay. Can like have like five seven minutes i'm sorry of, okay uh, not a problem absolutely no, okay I, I will be of uh, summing up conclusion or the key message okay i, I thought that it was ten minutes. more fast in the in the beginning of the this yeah, yeah. but let's uh, say 10 minutes i will let you know after no that. i think i think in five minutes i could uh and i i'm i'm sorry i i know it's bad to cross the time uh not a problem so don't worry okay uh, in the same uh, scope of Mises Institute, we have McKinsey Center for Economic Freedom. But the thing of McKinsey Center of Economic Freedom, it's the first think tank officially attached to a university. It's a, a, a for-profit university here in Brazil. Uh, and this center conducts teaching, uh, especially master's courses, research and extension programs. Uh, and they are very close to Mrs. Brazil Institute. So they, they, they are the main partner of the Mrs. Brazil Institute, uh, officially linked to a university, uh, an important university, I, I would say, this is uh, in Sao Paulo. Uh, they have been publishing, especially the Index of Economic Freedom in the country, uh, and they, they are composed of uh, more than uh, 15 researchers, doctors, masters, and so on. Uh, this is the partners of Center of McKinsey, the external partners. We could see uh, Atlas Network as a partner as well. Uh, we have other extensive examples that I mapped, but anyway, uh, I will pass go through. Uh, in the third, uh, in the third uh, classification that I, I mapped the, this thing, neoliberal think tanks in field of higher education, it's that they establish a paradoxical relationship 
with higher education and social science because uh, at the same time they need the leg legitimation legitimization of academic and expert knowledge they need to disqualify the current production of the social science in order to defend their theoretical agenda and their in their agenda of privatization so at the same time they they need higher education and students and researchers to become experts and specialists, they need to attack higher education in order to disqualify the other approaches, for example. Uh, then the argument of leftist indoctrinations come to the fore. Né? They, they argue that higher education institutions, uh, and especially public universities, are spaces of leftist indoctrination. Uh, and offer another kind of uh, uh, things that we uh, are drug people, we are cultivated uh, uh, marijuana in the universe. Enfim, uh, anyway, I'm sorry. They, they spread a, a kind of very bad things about uh, students and higher education. And they, they, their main targets are Granty and Paulo Freire, because they argue that they are the fathers of the socialist strategy of cultural Marxism, that uh, which is the Marxists and the socialists, they, wanted, they want to uh, create a socialist society, but their strategy is through the culture. So the intellectual spaces uh, are full of this kind of uh, Marxists and uh, socialists, intellectuals, and this kind of things. So, but the thing is, they could include almost every perspective in this kind of leftist indoctrination, even Foucault, uh, Deleuze, Habermas. And it's a it's a salad. Uh, but the main targets of this uh, neoliberal think tanks is Gantt and Paul Freire. And this is one of the reasons that I use Gantt because I thought it it would be a, a good provocation uh, to use Gantt. Uh, and so on, and because I like the Gantt theory, of course. And uh, uh, fourth, and uh, I'm ending. Uh, they, as I as I say, they defend a, a a very strong privatization agenda because they they see higher education and education and science as a com commodities. So for 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 them, uh, education and sciences are not public goods, but uh, and we need to, uh, to promote competition between stu students, between researchers for resources, for funding, for prestige. So it's a kind of emulation of the free market society uh, in higher education. They are, they are kind of uh, stand for this kind of uh, argument. So trying to be grant, I, I will be very, uh, try to be fast here. The think tanks, they operate in the, field, in the state and at the same time in the civil society, bringing ideas and connecting agendas. So that's why I, I bring the debate about, about hegemony, because the neoliberal think tanks are organizations that they operate between uh, this kind of historical process of privatization and com commodification of higher education and science in Brazil. At the same time, they're, they're important to the current austerity fiscal uh, uh, policy here in Brazil, uh, especially because our Minister of Economics, he, he is a Chicago boy, as we, we call in Latin America. Uh, so they circulate in that spaces uh, and they bring that narrative of disqualification of uh, higher education, of students, uh, this kind of leftist indoctrination, so basically, they, they could uh, circulate it in states and the civil society, bringing and connecting these agendas, these historical agendas, and the, the, the public policy. Uh, so neoliberal think tanks, as they are sources of organic intellectuals for the new right movement, uh, basically speaking, because they act uh, mostly by training specialists and leaders. So they, they, they have this connection between uh, the co cognitive and political leadership. Uh, they bring this connection. Uh, and they, they see the higher education as a, a source of expertise and, and leadership. 
Uh, but at the same time, higher education, it's an important field to act in the battle of ideas. And at the same time, uh, higher education, it's a field that could be very privatized. And it, in Brazil, especially a field, uh, a very uh, profitable field, uh, let's say that. So they, they could connect these discussions, this space, this organization. They connect businessmen with uh, the cognitive, the uh, knowledge production. So they kind of train, they, they, they do this kind of training of uh, specialists and so on. So that's it. Uh, sorry for passing the time, but thank you, Evandro. That's no, thank you, Evandro. That was uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, and I think that we only touched the uh, uh, surface of the problems that could be discussed and uh, productively uh, commented. Uh, I'm really interested. So I, uh, I have many questions and uh, I can give you some insights from the Polish trajectory of uh, developing the, the think tanks active in the field of higher education and science and uh, any other fields. But I will ask uh, right now Franek to uh, ask his uh, questions and comments as, as he prepared for that. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, sure. okay, come. Uh, yeah, so so thanks, thanks, Christian, for, mm -hmm. for introduction and, and thanks, Evandro, for like really super, super interesting uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, so like I, I will have two, two questions, but I will also like, like to a little uh, comment from from perspective from my perspective and perspective of my research and and thinking what what what, what you presented and like uh, the first thing was like really I really liked and like it was really inspired uh, by by your presentation was that you uh, showed that the uh, uh, this neoliberalization of, of academia or neoliberalism in, in higher education in, in Brazil is not some uh, kind of abstract ideology, but like it is, it is the action of a very complex network of different organizations uh, connected with foreign funding and uh, other, other organizations in, um, in politics or in higher education uh, worldwide. And, and I think, I think it, is, it is crucial uh, it, it is really, really good starting starting point to 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 to, to such analysis that do, to do not see such as changes in thinking as some like historical period, but rather as as some active polit result of some active political actions of, of very very strong very strong institutions. And I, I think like I, I also like this this paradox that that you mentioned that uh, on the one hand the neoliberal uh, think tanks uh, criticize Gramsci for uh, for being this uh, uh, leftist ideologist, but on the other hand, when you analyze their actions by using Gramsci, they are actually like quite good at like creating hegemony in in, in higher in higher education. So like this is uh, this is actually like uh, in, in, interesting interesting paradox and like. Uh, also, what what Gramsci was was saying about uh, that the the knowledge that that the 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 purpose of 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 many uh, political philosophies are are to uh, prevent uh, common people from from knowledge how to do politics. And I think I think this is this this can be some some similar move that they they criticize Gramsci, but on, on the other hand. Uh, themselves very very good organize uh, some some political political uh, hegemony. But like the, the the first question connected connected to to this was because mm, uh, like you, you you speak a lot about uh, uh, different research different think tanks and like this uh, how they organize students or how they organize journals. But like maybe you could uh, tell also something more uh, how they uh, influence uh, the perception of the of the higher education itself and uh, how uh, on the level of the state regulations and 
uh, and evaluation of scientists or uh, or universities uh, this, this think tank this think tanks uh, was 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 influential because like i i'm i'm guessing that this is this is the uh, the area they they could be the most the most su successful and and this is and and this is this leads to 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 the other question so like if if we because like you you described some kind of like uh, attack of the neoliberal think tanks on uh, on on Brazilian uh, academic academic sector and I was I was uh, interested in the in the other side like how uh, how much the this attack was successful and how to 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 what extent the the brazilian higher education was was able was able to to re, to resist this this attack and by which mechanism they they could they could resist because like you you mentioned a few times that the the brazilian universities are portrayed as uh, some kind of uh, hubs for for leftist ideology and i was i was wondering is it really true that they 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 have they are very strong uh, institutions that can that can resist this neoliberal ideology, uh, or is it just the uh, some Im, some uh, Im imagination produced uh, in order to to fight them politically? So yeah, that that would okay. be my my two Thank questions. Thank you, Sonic. Uh, I don't know. I have some questions that match some of your concerns. Uh, so maybe uh, if Evandro is taking notes, I can simply come up with them and add something to the discussion and then we'll have a response by Evandro, if that's uh, okay. Uh, so, okay. So first of all, Pranek mentioned this aspect uh, which interests me also methodologically uh, in terms uh, how you conducted your study. That's uh, in the presentation because of the lack of time we had a focus on the content and you mentioned also that you you listened to 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 the uh, agendas, to podcasts, to videos, and you know a lot about the content of the names of these think tanks. But uh, this aspect, which interests me uh, uh, more, is uh, this the scope of the impact that this agenda had, and how you research that, how you assess that. Uh, my question comes not only uh, from methodological. Uh, methodological interest, but also uh, me myself, I was like uh, leading two left-wing uh, organizations that would fit, uh, I, I'm leading one right now and the, the other one I simply stepped down recently, uh, but uh, they fit exactly the description of your, your, uh, your think tanks uh, here that you research in higher education. And I think that's, uh, 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 in terms of the activities included, we had like even broader scope that the Mrs. Brazil or Mrs. Journal, like something like that. But I never uh, seen any form of a strong impact on what is going on in policy. So, so this leads me to a, another question, uh, aspect of, uh, of that question. Like, do you think, would you agree that uh, uh, from the leftist point of view, the think tank job is not so fruitful as in terms, uh, it cannot be like, like simply structurally uh, so fruitful as uh, the, 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 the right, uh, right wing think tank job. Or maybe the, the, maybe you don't think that there are like any difference at, at all. I, I, I would say that there are like some sort of structural difference between the using the think tank strategy uh, between the sides of the, the workers and capital. But, and I would really love to hear uh, about uh, what do you think about that? And uh, second, uh, second it will be a third question probably. The third question will be about uh, can connect that would were there any spaces for hope that comes from your research? Like uh, you focus on the right wing uh, think tanks, but uh, is there any message from your research other than uh, than simply 
which is uh, good per, per cell, like it's good enough, like to, to map the dominance of the neoliberal think tank in higher education in Brazil. But uh, is there any space for, uh, for hope that comes from your research? Another, another question would be uh, that deals with, with the label that you use and uh, 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 the neoliberal think tank. If you describe your research focus as such, uh, how fruitful it is, according to you, to research this new right wing movement uh, with searching for the things that uh, that 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 uh, match this label? Because the uh, the uh, this the this chaotic right wing movement in Brazil, I think that is uh, like the wider atmosphere in the world today, like, like in states in Poland in the UK, that this chaotic uh, new right includes many, 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 many different uh, uh, goals and aims, and uh, they are not limited to the sphere of economics per se. And uh, if you search for neoliberal think tanks, as uh, was reported from your study, you usually end up seeing the activities within this space of sciences like social science uh, and economics. Uh, are the think tanks that you studied also active in other spheres of uh, uh, science, in other disciplines? What are their agenda over that? And uh, yeah, I would say the, let's stop with that. It's way too much, way too general. And uh, you can simply pick, uh, uh, pick something uh, that you think is uh, like useful for you and answer. So, so, so yeah. Yes, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Fennec and Christian for the, the questions and for the, the inputs. Uh, I, I, I think I could try to answer all of them because uh, first, yes, I try to methodologically speaking to answer uh, Christian and uh, some comments of uh, Fennec. Uh, I was kind of influenced in my my program by grounded theory. I not to use it grounded theory uh, as the way that they present, but I started my actually my my research through uh, mapping the network of think tanks. So it was uh, the basically the first thing that I that I I did because in the beginning I was interested in uh, try to simply understand the connection between these organizations and higher education because uh, for example University of Campinas we have this movement and this kind of thing so I try to follow the network as I could say I do not uh, use perspectives as such actor network theory or so on uh, I simply trace the, the networks I conduct them uh, uh, it was a simple methodology but it was a very difficult one because uh, I was, uh, I, I, I take the, for example, Institute Mrs. Brazil, and I, I started to follow the, their partnerships, uh, their uh, knowledge production. So uh, if they produce some, some kind of article or book with other think tanks, with other authors, with other uh, political movements, I... I was following them and in identifying how they operate, how they uh, connect with uh, each other. And in, this, in the middle of this kind of tracing the network, I was picking the higher education issue. So I, I, tried, try, I was trying to uh, map the way that they operate in higher education in this kind of network. So basically I conduct my study uh, I have a lot of uh, tables and figures and uh, many many materials different kind of materials that uh, I use it so I, I, I also uh, read all, almost all the materials of the main, main think tanks as documents uh, some articles uh, some books um, so basically I, I I started with a very empirical approach, and then I, I uh, started to add uh, the neoliberal discussion and the 
grant uh, approach to analyze the, the, the material and these kind of things. So, uh, so, so, so yes, I, I, I was interested in the connection, uh, basically, the connections. And uh, let's say, uh, I will try to respond to uh, Christian and Frenek in the same time about the methodology. And uh, to answer uh, Frenek, uh, yes, they have a kind of this, this kind of paradoxical, paradoxical way of acting in the field of education. Uh, and I use Grant, Grant because I like Grant. I, I, I'm a, a, a fan of the, the Grant's work. Uh, but I, I want to, to, not to prove, but I want to kind of uh, show that they are operating with the hegemony, actually, and not the opposite. Because they, they argue that they are against the hegemonical Marxist indoctrination culturally and this kind of thing. So I thought this paradox is very interesting in my research. Uh, so I try to use this kind of approach to uh, rethink and try to show empirically and analytically that they nowadays, they have the hegemony in their side. So basically speaking, that was my, my, my goal when I was dealing with the data. Uh, how they influence the, the perception of higher education itself. It, it's an interesting question because uh, they disseminated a lot of uh, tests, a lot, a, lot, a lot of material, on, especially on the internet, uh, and especially in social media. Uh, they have connection with our mainstream media, so they, they publish uh, papers on big journals, big uh, newspapers here in Brazil. So they are they mostly buy tests and acting in social media, Facebook, Twitter, and these kind of things, and the big uh, newspapers that we have here in Brazil. So in terms of the, the public opinion, and they, they have a very strong, uh, some of them in the social media. So in my research, I, I enter in Facebook groups, for, for example, to analyze. Of course, I didn't use this kind of approach, analyzing social network. Uh, uh, social media, uh, but they have they had a some a, a, a strong influence with young people that uh, before they try to enter in the in the higher education landscape. So uh, I saw a lot of uh, teenagers like uh, fifteen years old that they was very influenced by. Uh, for example, Mrs. Brazil Institute, uh, including cogitating not to uh, do a higher education course because they was very convinced that higher education courses are, are, are spaces of leftist indoctrination. So we could see, uh, I could see this kind of uh, spread of views uh, in social media, uh, they, they, they have uh, channels on YouTube that they promote interviews, podcasts. And so I could access this, this dissemination uh, process to these this, uh, uh, ways. Uh, well, uh, and I, I will try to respond the impact of this hard the, this neoliberal think tanks at the same time that I, I'm responding about the success of this neoliberal think tank and the, the ways of, of resisting. I'm sorry I'm speaking too much. I don't know if we have time, but... Uh, uh, there is also uh, another question from our person. Ah, okay. So, so, but uh, okay. yeah, go on, go on. Answer okay. and uh, but have this... Okay. Yeah. So actually it was a, a thing that I didn't work, especially about the impact. I... Well, it, it is a limitation of my study. Uh, to think about the actual impact of this uh, neoliberal think tanks, I could only see the impact in the my micro perspective uh, that the organizations that I studied most, like uh, the impact on some research centers because they are creating some research centers in higher education institutions, uh, or some of them could be su successfully creating student activists in some higher education institutions, or some of them uh, 
for example, uh, couldn't, for example, in Unicamp, uh, the, the move, there is the, this movement in Unicamp, but it's a very weak movement because normally the students and some professors uh, simply, simply ignore them. Uh, so, or make fun of them because they are kind of, uh, uh, it depends on the higher education institution. So it's difficult to measure the impact on higher education institutions itself. I know uh, my research shows that these think tanks are important to the new right movement as a, a, a whole. So this was that I, I could identify, but the impact in higher education institutions itself, uh, it's a limitation of my study. Uh, uh, about the, the neoliberalism, very quickly, it's hard to deal with neoliberalism as a theoretical discussion, as organizations, I, I tried to simplify my research. I was following the neoliberal intellectual movement, very empirically speaking, historically speaking, connections. So I could identify the think tanks to, because they have direct connections between multiple society, Atlas Network, and other kind of think tanks. So they have different perspectives also, it's heterogeneous, but I could identify them. And most of them, they they assume that they are think tanks. They assume that they are connected with Atlas, with multiple in society. So uh, that's it. Uh, about the leftist uh, think tanks, that's why I, I don't uh, deal, uh, I don't work too much in my research with talking about think tanks as a kind of idea, idealistic object, because for me, uh, influenced by a, a more uh, even Marxist or a materialist perspective, there is a plenty of difference between uh, leftist think tanks and neoliberal think tanks that uh, for me it's almost, they do the same kind of activities trying to deal with knowledge, but for me they are different in, t in terms of materially and historically speaking because uh, they are inserted in different historical uh, networks and connections. Normally, the neoliberal think tanks they have a strong uh, uh, participation of businessmen, so they have resources. They have uh, well, they have the hegemony in their side. So basically, the leftist think tanks they normally they don't have this hegemony. Uh, uh, thinking about the social landscape, political landscape, economic landscape uh, behind them. So for me, it's a kind of different. For example, in Brazil, we had. Uh, very, very uh, strong leftist organizations that we could classify as think tanks before the, the military de dictatorship in the 60s. Uh, but now we haven't. So I think it's a kind of, uh, for me, it's different. Uh, I know that, the, for example, leftist think tanks uh, could do the same uh, thing as publishing, uh, conducting studies, publishing, this kind of things. But for me, uh, historically speaking, they are different, uh, most of because of the resources, networks, and historical uh, pathways. Thank you very much for all the answers. And uh, yeah, Thais Dibberen uh, have a- Yes, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very well. OK. So uh, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Sorry uh, for not opening my camera. I'm having technical problems today here in my um, uh, computer. And uh, Evandro, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, well, first, um, congratulations for the effort of uh, summarizing our research. I believe it was a great challenge, uh, yeah. as I know. And I have already read your research. It's more than 300 pages. So <laughs> it was a, a huge effort. Uh, so I, I would like to know about the performance of this think tanks during the pandemic in the field of higher education in Brazil and even in Latin America context. So uh, we know that our current president, I'm from Brazil too, uh, didn't have a positive attitude uh, managing the pandemic. So the economic context, uh, the economic side, uh, of the pandemic was the most important aspect for them. And I think for these think tanks too, because they share the same um, 
uh, knowledges and uh, the same uh, uh, aspects of the discourse. So did, did this um, think tanks act in any way in relation to the pandemic, considering the field of higher education or even during the management of the pandemic? I mean, um, they influenced in some way uh, the, the action of our president and uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thais, for the question. Uh, well, my, my research uh, didn't cover the COVID-19 uh, issue because of the time of the research. The, the, these think tanks, they suffered a, a kind of, a, uh, they suffer with the, the COVID-19 pandemic in the field of education because uh, basically speaking, higher education institutions uh, was closed, so they couldn't operate uh, physically speaking or organizing students or these kind of things. Uh, but they they could manage to operate in, so in through the social media, for example, trying to organize uh, the students and researchers through through the internet. So. I don't know much, uh, very much about that because I I ended my research and I didn't cover the pandemic uh, aspect. So I I believe that's it. Uh, and I don't I don't know if I if I forget one um, one question. Uh, I think I forget one question of Thais, but and to talk about hope and resistance, I remember uh, the question about Frenek and Christian. I, I think. Every higher education institution uh, is trying to, to deal with this kind of movement. Uh, sometimes uh, it's hard to tell because uh, it's uh, so diverse inside higher education institutions and some, uh, some of political groups inside higher education institutions are, uh, could manage to deal with these groups uh, debating and trying to show these connections, trying to show their, their interests in this kind of things. But in the scope of uh, public policy, it has been difficult because of the government. So I don't know uh, how to deal with that. But in the scope of the public opinion, as let's say as a general uh, contest, uh, we saw some initiatives of academics trying to uh, Dismystify that that thing that academics are leftists only leftists and uh, this kind of doctrination. So there is a lot of work uh, of some scientists and academics to show the importance of higher education institutions, importance of research, including social science. Uh, the pandemic actually it's a hor horrible thing, but the pandemic brought this kind of uh, impulse to to us to show that higher education and social science and science matters is important. So I think we could manage in that way, but in terms of politics, it's hard. It has been hard. I don't know how to deal with that in a short term. Okay. There is uh, also a question by Lucy Cespedes. Yes, thank you, Evandro. Um, the presentation was great. Uh, the topic is fascinating and, and very urgent to, to study right now. Um, I just wanted to ask if in your mapping and, and in, in your study, um, have you found any ties between um, the leaders or, or the institutions that, that you've um, identified and uh, the, um, the military dictatorship in, in Brazil? Because in, in Argentina, at least the, um, when, when democracy came back in the 80s, um, private think tanks were, were a space where the, the, the thinkers, let, let's say, or that, that inherited the, the program and the agenda of our military government uh, took refuge, let's say. Uh... Yes, we have this kind of connection. It's a, it's a kind of uh, paradox or contradiction because many of 
I think think tanks they uh, argue that they are kind of the the defensors of the freedom, the freedom society. But at the same time, they uh, most of them they try to a kind of uh, spread the perception that the military dictatorship uh, in Brazil in the 60s, and I believe in Argentina and other kind of Latin American countries, it was not so hard as the academics and the researchers, they, 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 they've they been uh, arguing and uh, showing through research or, or through this, uh, on the media, on this kind of thing. So basically speaking, uh, most of them, they are kind of, I, I, I don't know how to explain. At the same time, they, they don't uh, want to be uh, a strong defensors of the di dictator militatorship. They want to uh, spread the view that that was not was a kind of a soft thing that was a necessary thing to fight in again against socialism and communism and this kind of thing. So they have a kind of a contra con contradictory way of uh, dealing with that. But uh, for example, Mrs. Brazil Institute, the father of the the main uh, uh, the main leader of Mrs. Brazil Institute, it called Elio Beltrão, was a minister in the, in the dictatorship government. So it's a, it, we, we could uh, uh, see some familiar connections, some business connections between businessmen of the military dictatorship and the founders and the, uh, the some businessmen that participated in this think tank. So this is another kind of interesting thing to, to analyze. Uh, and I think that's it. They, I know that, for example, uh, in Chile, uh, they, they, there was think tanks, uh, mostly with Austrian, uh, Chicago School of Economics. Uh, yes, so they, they operate, operated in a, in a very strong way with uh, the uh, Pinochet regime and this kind of thing. So there's connections also with uh, the dictatorships movements in uh, Latin America. That's really interesting. And I, uh, to conclude our seminar, thank you, Evander. Thank you, uh, uh, you for uh, participating in the seminar. I think this only opens up the discussion uh, because uh, uh, for me, it would be super interesting to find someone who researched similar topics uh, like in Poland to briefly introduce you to the difference here is that uh, Neoliberal think tanks are not so much active in the sphere of higher education and science in Poland because there is no, uh, you know, whole economics is based simply on uh, uh, neoclassical economics and there is nothing to be fight for. Uh, so, 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 and we had a little bit different uh, transformation, uh, like, like you escaped uh, now neoliberal junta, I would say, like military junta that support the neoliberal transformation. And we had something like a quasi-socialism that was overthrown by a social movement that happened to be infiltrated by the neoliberal think tanks. And so they simply infiltrated the social movement in the 80s. And then simply go uh, government reshuffled the landscape. And right now we have a, a much more problems in higher education with the infiltration by a radical right wing in the spheres of, I don't know, like ethics, uh, law, philosophy, philosophy, even some sorts of science, like, like economics is not not the stake in the, uh, in the battle between the social forces uh, in Poland. But this is all, uh, the material for another uh, seminar. And I think that's, uh, I would love uh, this dialogue to continue. And uh, if you want to, uh, I don't know, like the, connect with us somehow, like, like we are open for having a, another seminar on topics related with, uh, yeah, critical investigation of higher education and science uh, systems. And I think that we can uh, think in this group or beyond this group to, to, to to simply have some more fruitful comparisons, because uh, sometimes uh, sometimes I think that no matter the 
uh, surface differences, it's easier to talk between the uh, so-called semi-peripheries than uh, from the peripheral position with the people from the center. And uh, there are uh, like much more understanding that, that could be produced and at the level of a simply materiality of life and uh, reality of the problems. Okay, so thank you very much and uh, see you. Thank you. And for sure, I would love to continue this dialogue and know more about the Polish case. Very well.